I, I was thinking uh, of this verse uh, uh, in worship. I don't know why. It's in the it's very very end of uh, the Bible in Revelation 22, halfway through the last chapter of Scripture, and it talks about uh, the time right at the end, and, it, and it's a, it's an encouragement for us if you're on the right side of this. Revelation 22, 10 and 11, just the end of verse 10. Uh, it shouldn't come up. I just I just plugged it in here. For the time is at hand. Say the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, say that's me. He is holy, let him be holy still. Uh, we have a job to do in this day. You know, I could go on, and I do sometimes about the politics in the world. I, I stay a little too closely uh, connected to what's going on. There is a lot of turmoil. You might not know about it, but I tell you what, uh, there's lots of people saying uh, World War III could break out uh, at any moment. And uh, if, uh, you know, that's not your concern, I don't want to get you worried about that. But don't think that God has lost control. He, he told us at the end it would get really chaotic to the point that he comes back and takes his church out of there. Just like when judgment was coming uh, at the time of Noah, God took the ark out of there. Uh, just like at Sodom and Gomorrah, these are the signs that Jesus said in the days of Noah as the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Before God flattened Sodom and Gomorrah, he took Lot and his family out of there. He's coming to take the church. Maybe we'll preach on that in a few weeks or months. I don't know. I'll probably go around it. But uh, uh, God has not lost control. We, we have a job to do. Say, we have a job to do. You have a job to do. I have a job to do. Reaching as many people for Jesus. We write it on the wall. Reach as many people as you can for Jesus. Then once we've reached them, we need to teach them to be obedient to the whole of Scripture, not just part of it, and then mobilize them in this job that we have to do to reach more people. This is our job. The world is chaotic. Uh, Ukraine could become a real big problem, bigger than it is now. Uh, the Middle East, uh, Taiwan, it, it, it's just all over. Politically, things are insane. Um, but us, we have a job to do. That is not to be unexpected. That is to be expected when you read Scripture. And so what is our, our job? Well, it's to reach, teach, and mobilize. Amen? That's the vision. We try to simplify it as, 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 little, as simply as possible in victory. And one of the things we like to do as leadership is give you an opportunity uh, to express your part of this, th this deal. We want to bring as many people in, not just to the church, we're talking into the faith. Well, the big church, I met with a pastor last week, called, she called it the, 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 the Little C Church or something like that, and I said, well, we're what are you talking about? She said, well, I mean the whole church. And uh, the, the whole church. And it's not just Victory Church. It's, it's other, other divisions within the church. And, and uh, wanting to see them uh, just ignite in this area. Uh, powerful stuff. Now, how do we do that? How do you have your part in that? Well, we try to give you opportunities. So what we're going to do, uh, September 22nd, we're going to have, we're going to call it an open house. Uh, I, I, we, we bantered around the names and what it is is just a, a, a contact point for you to focus on uh, within the next week or two we're going to have invitations for you to invite people you want to see what the what's going on in the Victory Church why don't you come that day we'll give free hot dogs away or free I don't know free chihuahuas I don't know whatever we can give away it, it's, it's all just a shtick to get people to come in and to see uh, wh what God is doing and, and the opportunity to let them hear the gospel. Now you can preach the gospel to them across your fence, uh, at the grocery store, whatever, but if you if that, that, uh, that's great to do that, but if you bring them in here, we're going to preach to them for sure and where, the, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he's there in the midst of them. So we're believing God for uh, a harvest on that day, September 22nd. Can you say amen? So, so we're, we're not even have the promotional material yet, but I just want you to be thinking about that. Who are you going to invite? Uh, maybe you want to make a list of four or five people you want to pray for and invite. It'd be good to write down their names and start praying for them now. 
because we battle not against flesh or blood, but against spirits, principalities. Amen? And so be thinking about that. That'll be our touch point. Uh, you can invite people to church any week, but that'll be a great week. And it'll be a great week for you to be here, too. It's a shame when you invite somebody to church, and that's the, the Sunday you miss. Uh, you know, it, it's good to be here. Anyway, so so this week I'm going to continue. Last week I started a little series, series and uh, it's got the word elementary in it. So I thought of Sherlock Holmes, elementary, my dear Watson. Well, these are elementary Christian beliefs, and it's amazing to me how many uh, people that are part of the church don't know these simple things. I go over this every four or five years. I go back and I work through this passage again, uh, because these are the foundation stones. If we don't have these things down, how can we build uh, upon it? Amen? So I want to read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, to chapter 6, verse 3. A uh, little section here in Hebrews and, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, Hebrews 5.12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary, say elementary, the elementary principles of Christ let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and, the eternal, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits." Praise the Lord. Well, God permits. He wants us to uh, go deeper, but we have to every once in a while go back and check the foundation. Do we have our foundation stones in, in place? Uh, you know, and uh, so that's what the process here. Last week, I spent the, the whole uh, message talking about repentance, uh, and uh, I won't go into detail. You can get that online. Uh, metneo is a Greek word. It means to, once you have a revelation on something, afterwards you think and you make shifts. You make changes to line your life up with the revelation. And, and I, I made a, a point last week of saying a, a spirit of, revela of repentance isn't just that salvation. You need to adopt a repentant heart from the day you're born again forward. How are you going to be transformed from glory to glory into the very image of the Son if you don't keep a repentant heart when God shows you something else uh, that you need to change, that you say, yes, Lord, you're the Lord. Uh, God, give me strength to change this thing. So, so repentance needs to be a, an ongoing thing. Even the Apostle Paul said, not that I arrived, but I press on uh, to reach the, the mark of the high calling in Christ. And so uh, at this time, we need to grow up and we need to uh, put aside our pride and, and all these other things uh, that keep us entrenched in our patterns of behavior and allow God to continue to remold us and and shape us. I'm preaching pretty good. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> so this is the first uh, foundation. Uh, with us, with, if this stone of your foundation isn't in place, your house is not going to stand through the trials that are, are, are coming up. Repentance from dead work and toward, faith towards God. And, and it amazes me on, in the body of Christ now, there, there's many that are moving back away from a, 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 a personal relationship with Jesus where you can know him, uh, where you can go directly into his presence. Uh, the veil has been torn. You can go right into his presence. Jesus has paid the price for you so that you can have a relationship with God. And many are going back to tradition and to religion and rules. And it just grieves my heart. Amen. Amen. Sacraments, good works. Now, it's all right to, to go to church. It's all right to give. It's all right to have communion. It's all right to, we, we should do the things that they call sacraments, but they're just symbolic of a, of a greater truth that Jesus died for me and he set me free. Getting in a baptismal tank does not make me born again. Tithing... 
15%. I've met people that tithe 90%. God bless them. Very wealthy man. I, I met in, in Phoenix and a very, very wealthy real estate mogul. And he, his goal in life was to get up to 90%. And he did. But he's not born again because he's given 90%. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith in Christ alone. And this too is a gift of God. So where is our hope? If you lose that foundation stone and think it's, it's about how good you are, you're, 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 you know, you need to be good. You need to serve. You need to do all these things. But we need to trust Jesus. Amen? So that, that's repentance from uh, dead works towards faith in, in God. That's a foundation stone uh, in, in the church. And then the, what I want to talk about today is baptisms. Uh, now, the, the word in Greek is baptismos, which is the plural form. Say plural. Uh, you know what plural is, right? More, more than one. <laughs> but I, I was raised in a church that never talked about more than one baptism. In fact, they, if they did talk about it, it was against it. But that is not a repentant heart that looks at the scripture and makes adjustments to our thinking to line up with the word. In classical Greek, baptizo, uh, baptizo is, is a word that means to dip, to plunge, to immerse, to make fully wet, uh, like you would dip a piece of cloth. If you wanted to turn a piece of white cloth into blue cloth, you want to dip the whole thing. You want to immerse it. That's the word, baptizo. And, and this is why we believe in full immersion uh, baptism. Now, if you're in a hospital bed or something, you know, it's, it's not, it's a symbol. Say a symbol. You're not getting born again. Your sins aren't washed away by, by your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus. But we line ourselves up with it. But, but the word used here is not that word. It's baptismos, which is plural, which means more than one. Now, can I show you in Scripture more than one baptism? Yes. Say yes. <laughs> My favorite passage to go on this is, is, is Acts chapter 19, 1 to 7. Now, if you look at Acts chapter 18, we hear the story of Apollos. He says he taught the word of God accurately he was right on i call him a baptist he's baptizing people he's teaching them uh, and then priscilla and aquila come along and there was something in his teaching that was a missing uh, with apollos he has this this group of of disciples there's something missing in priscilla and aquila it's kind of neat that it was the woman whose name was given first that means something in scripture too and and they take him aside and they teach him something they teach him something that he was missing and off he goes to corinth to plant not the, the first and the greatest Pentecostal church of the new age. In fact, they had to tone down the gifts of the Spirit there. Something changed in his life. And then we have Acts chapter 19. Uh, Apollos takes off and, and off he goes to Corinth. And, and, and along comes Paul. And this is where we pick it. You know, the, I told you last week, the chapter breaks are, are we added them. They weren't in part of the story. This is a continuation of that story. And it says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers and he says in verse 2 did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed and he asked he asked them no they replied we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit then what baptism did you experience he asked and they replied the baptism of John Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So here we have two baptisms, baptism in water for, for, to, to show repentance that you're, you're following Jesus, and, and then baptism in the Spirit to be empowered with the Spirit so that you won't just be a, a believer that's saved, now that's good, and now I'll just sit down and wait for Jesus to come back. No, God wants to inject you with power. You shall be endued with power. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall be endued with power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And I'll tell you what, God God wants his church moving in power today. 
Now you think, well, that doesn't happen, and people have blended this together and all kinds of things. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I first started serving Jesus in the Presbyterian Church. I was an elder in the Presbyterian Church. This is years ago, and then uh, we got baptized in the Spirit, and we didn't fit there anymore. One thing led to another. Uh, Ten years later, I'm, or five years later, I'm, I'm uh, pastoring a, a a victory church in Moose Jaw. And I run into in the in Castle Lumber in Moose Jaw. I remember the, the missionary, a Presbyterian ministry, missionary from the northern part of Saskatchewan. And I ran into him in the lumber yard. And, and he, oh, a long time ago, he said, I hear you're pastoring a, a, a church that believes in the Holy Spirit. I said, Yeah, yeah. And, and I said, Yeah, that's right. And he says, Can you tell me, can you tell me about the Holy Spirit? What is this about the Holy Spirit? This is a guy been through seminary, uh, given up his life uh, to serve Jesus. He, he, he knew the word of God accurately, and he knew nothing of the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and this is a foundation. Amen. It should be what they talk about in day one in seminary. He shouldn't be on. It's good to ask in the lumberyard anyway. Uh, Andrew was his name. I won't say his last name in case he's watching. Uh, <laughs> well, first, water baptism. What, 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 what water baptism isn't? Water baptism doesn't get you saved. Tithing doesn't get you saved. Communion doesn't get you saved. Getting married doesn't get you saved. These are all good things that a Christian should do, but there's only one thing that gets you saved, and that's the blood of Jesus when he gave his life up for you. Can you say amen? amen. So baptism is not salvation. Well, you need to repent, and then you need to be baptized. Now you're saved. <laughs> Wrong answer. So what is baptism? Well, it's a symbol, say a symbol of something that's already happened. And, and I've got, to, I, I'm going to go through this quickly, but I've got seven things about baptism. Maybe uh, you, you, you just, and you could probably make a list of 72. I don't know how many genders there are. Oh, wait, I do, two. <laughs> but I don't know how many reasons there are for baptism or how many things it symbolizes a, a lot. Number one, it's a step of obedience. Say obedience. You make Jesus Lord of your life. And he says, repent and be baptized. Yeah, but I don't understand. He doesn't care. There's going to be a lot of things you don't understand that he asks you to do. Are you making him Lord of your life or not? Now, I can tip you off. There's a lot of other information here. But no, number one, uh, if you have repented and you're now going to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. You need to follow him. And he says, be baptized. Say baptized. Now, if you don't do that, why would he expect you to do anything else? So number one, it's a step of, uh, of obedience. Number two, it's a humbling of ourselves before God. It's a little humbling when you don't know much about anything. And you got and the church is asking you to get all wet in front of everybody. I don't know about you, it was humbling for me. And by the time I figured out what it meant, it wasn't humbling really, because I was just so excited. We got baptized in a lake in northern Saskatchewan uh, to come to the understanding. God's asked me to do this. I'm going to do it. Uh, they baptized me. They called it when I was a child with the sprinkling and the. Uh, that that that's not really in in the Bible, eh? No, if, if you want to hang on to that as your baptism, I'm okay with that. What I really need to know is, do you believe Jesus died for you? Now, that's primary importance, but it's a step of, uh, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands, John 14, 15. And what did he say? Repent and be baptized. So I'm going to uh, uh, obey him. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 5 says, be clothed in humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to to the humble, gives grace. Grace has kind of a, it's a two-sided coin. It's unmerited favor, but it's also divine empowerment. Jesus was full of grace, and he, he merited every, favor, every bit of favor. So what, he had the power of God. I want that, so I want to walk in humility, and when God says to do something, do it. Amen? 
Number three, it's a public declaration of following Christ. Matthew 10, 32, why is this important? Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, uh, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do you want to be denied before the Father? Well, then don't be afraid of people's faces. And you get in the church, we usually have 300 people or so on, on those services. Uh, uh, and uh, you're getting all wet for Jesus. Uh, no, number four, you're identifying with Jesus. Now, uh, I, I'm out of time already, and I'm not even started, so uh, I'm gonna, you're identifying with his death, Romans 6, verses 7 and 8. Uh, you're identifying with his burial. Uh, you're, you're, you're saying, I'm following Jesus. He was crucified. He was dead. He was buried. And so going in the water, you're, you're following in his footsteps. Uh, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a reality. You don't really die physically in there. Uh, but spiritually, if you, if you, if you say, God, I, I, I'm serious about this thing. Uh, I, I'm identifying with your death. I'm identifying with your burial. And I'm also identifying with your resurrection because Jesus came out of the well we come up out of the water and now I'm a new creation can, can you say amen but it's not the actual process of baptism that's done in the spirit uh, but you're making it manifest in the natural so that it became real to you it needs to become real so I'm going to skip that whole section it symbolizes starting a new life when you're coming up uh, I'm skipping over all through my notes I'm driving crazy in the back it's symbolic that we've entered a new covenant uh, in the old covenant you were circumcised as a man uh, now we don't do that uh, or at least you don't have to do that uh, but you're baptized it's a higher covenant and, and, and number seven, uh, it symbolizes joining the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, I'm not going to skip this. This is for by one spirit you were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or frees. You're baptized into a local church, but you're baptized into a greater church. Now, my son, and well, one of my sons and his wife and two and a half babies, if that's the thing, it'll be three babies next month, uh, have moved to Edmonton. And I miss them like crazy. My biggest concern is they get into a good church. They get into a good church. Their family is going to be a lot more protected. Their marriage is going to be more protected. Good church. So we're praying on the way in today from where our house that God help them. They went to a church last week. They thought it was the church. And man, they were just uninspired. So we're praying, Father, let them find a good church. And I've told him where I want him to go. <laughs> but he's in his 30s. He'll go where he wants to go. I just hope God directs him where God wants him to go. Yeah. Amen. Well, so baptism in water, that's the one baptism. Here's, an, here's another baptism. We got all these symbols too, you know. Uh, I, I heard, the first time I heard this taught uh, was... Um, Lawrence Boyer, we were, in, we were in Manipur, India, and he was teaching this, and I'd never even thought of it before. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he took them through the water at the Red Sea, right? And then they went through the wilderness wandering period. And now when he wants them to go in and conquer the land, he backed up the Jordan River, and they passed through the water the second time, symbolic of a second baptism, where they're empowered now. Say empowered where they're empowered to do what God's called them to do. They were already set apart out of Egypt, but they weren't stepping into their promises yet. They were still wandering. And too much of the church is wandering right now. Uh, it needs to be empowered. Uh, Acts 1 verses 4 and 5 and verse 8 uh, records this. And, and when they were eating with him, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized, say baptized, with the Holy Spirit here. Now we had Jesus talking about two baptisms. Uh, again, why so much of the modern church wants to ignore this. 
uh, at their own peril. And then verse 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. If we bring that into our context, uh, you will be my witnesses. It doesn't say you're going to be a big shot, really Holy Ghost, big shot. No, you'll be his witnesses first in your community, and then in Regina, Saskatchewan, and to the end of Canada. I don't know, you can draw those concentric circles, uh, but the big deal is to be a witness for Christ. This is why we're going to have a grand opening Sunday, give you an opportunity, something to rally around to invite people uh, to hear about Jesus. Can you, you can sell them on hot dogs. I don't, the Chihuahua thing was a joke, okay? Although they'd probably be pretty good on a bun. I don't know if you heat them up enough. <laughs> we, we desperately need the power of God these, in, in these days. Not just to, to survive, uh, but that we can be effective witnesses. Say witnesses. witnesses. In, a, in a way, now this will get, somebody will go after me. In a way, we're Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. Uh, but not like that. Uh, we're witnesses for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, Jesus is, or Jesus witnesses, and uh, Jehovah is just another name. Uh, the power of the Holy Spirit will manifest in all kinds of different ways. Here's one, uh, another reason for the church. You don't get everything. You get something. And all those pieces working together make the church strong. And, 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 and there's another sad thing about the church. There's a lot of church people aren't connected to a church body. And they're firing over here on their, their own. But if they get part of the, the group, you'd have everything you need. Can you, can you say amen? 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So that we can work together as a body. And, and if you want to know where they are in the Bible, they're in 1 Corinthians 12, there's a list. In Romans 12, there's a list. In Ephesians 4, there's a list. In 1 Peter 4, there's a list. Gift of wisdom, gift of knowledge, gift of faith, gift of healing, gift of miracles, gift of prophecy, gift of discerning of spirits, gift of tongues, interpreting tongues, gift of administration, gift of helps. And this is just a partial list. There's all kinds of things, maybe not even on that list, that God can give you in a particular situation to help you witness for him. Amen? Amen. You got a couple more minutes? <laughs> how, how do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? By faith. I tell you, I struggled this. I was a bit of a Presbyterian the theologian at, at one time. I studied the word. But I was studying it in a paradigm that rejected this stuff. And then my best friend became a Pentecostal pastor. And we'd argue till three in the morning sometimes why the baptism of the Spirit isn't for today. And he'd read me these passages and I had to r r r repent. And I'd argue all the conservative theological blah, blah, blah. And he's sharing and and I can remember he'd leave after I'd been arguing for two hours and I'd get down on my knees and I'd cry out to God, I need that. I knew in my heart it was real. But I had a problem here. And the biggest thing you got to do is get out of here and get into here and receive like a little child and say, God, I open my heart. I want everything that you've got for me. Can we say that together? God. I want everything that you have for me. Another, I don't know if we call it a lie, but another mistake that I was taught that once you're born again, you get everything that you are ever going to get from God as far as gifts. Well, what was Paul, this isn't in my notes, guys. Sorry, guys, in the back. Uh, what was he talking about in Romans 1 verse 11 when he says, I long to get to you so I can lay my hands on you and impart some spiritual gift that you may be established. 
He's writing to a church. They're already born again. They already know about the Holy Spirit. And he's wanting to lay his hands on them. Oh, I'm excited about next week. I'm going to teach you one of the foundations. Say foundations. Say elementary. Is laying on of hands. There's power when we come together in faith trusting God, humbling ourselves, walking in obedience and saying, God, I want more. Amen. As long as you understand it's not for you, it's so the body can be built up. Why don't you stand to your feet? Did you get anything today? I'll tell you what, we can get all, I, we can look at the news, we can think of, think of the wars, we can, uh, it's good to know that that's going on, but the men of Issachar, it says, they understood their times and they knew what they ought to do. And what we ought to do is press into God, draw on him to receive as much as we can for our individual situation to be effective witnesses for him at this time. The end is coming. Our job is to rescue as many people as possible. Can you say amen? amen. Now I'm going to invite the prayer team to come up. And if uh, you need prayer for anything, it's powerful to get uh, people to agree with you. Honey, can I just give you this? I'll lose it again. Um, if you've never been baptized in the Spirit, most of you have heard this before, you've been baptized in the Spirit. If not, come up, I'll lay hands on you. I, I believe any one of these, these people can lay hands on you, you can receive it, but if you, if you want to come to the man of God, <laughs> Phil's over there, so you can go to him. We've got men and women of God all over this room. Praise God. We're building a mighty army in this place, and we will be productive in this season. We will have much to offer the Lord. This is a desire of my heart to hear, well done, Terry. Well done, Phil. Well done, Brian. Well done, each one of you. That's what we want to hear. And what does he want us to do? To witness in power. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I don't know what you're waiting for. The signs are all around us that he's going to soon uh, sound the trumpet. Uh, why don't we all pray this together? Father, I thank you that you are holy. You are perfect. You are awesome. You are all powerful. And you will judge sin. And I am a sinner. I've done many things wrong. No amount of religion can save me. But I believe Jesus can save me by what he did. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. Help me to turn around now and follow you in obedience. In Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed today's worship service. I'm the other Pastor Terry. If you're new here, we would love to meet you and have you introduce yourself at reginavictory.com. You can drop us a line and let us know you're watching.